Hello everyone, I'm Jake Barrett and for those of you who don't know me, I'm a filmmaker, director and consultant from Birmingham working in commercials, television and the world of corporate video. Welcome to the Barrett Film Company Presents, a brand new video blog series where I discuss all the latest with film, video and expert marketeers from across the country, finding out what it takes to deliver successful campaigns and creative work for clients both big and small. In today's episode, I'm here with the highly regarded speaker, business consultant and marketing genius, Louis Barnett, to discuss important stages of the marketing process and how we can guarantee to produce content that doesn't just look pretty, but pretty much guarantees maximum audience impact. Louis, nice to meet you. Tell us a little bit about what it is that you do and why you're here today. Yeah, so um, basically my background all started leaving school at the age of 11. I was diagnosed with a load of different sort of learning disabilities, which I think always gave me a different perspective on life. Started a chocolate business in my parents' kitchen. Um, age of 13, became Waitrose Youngest Ever Supplier, 14 Sainsbury's and 15 Selfridges. And then just a few short years later, we were selling to 17 countries around the world. So, um, you know, started out in the industry of chocolate and grew a business from my parents' kitchen table to a globally trading business, learned an awful lot about branding and marketing particularly. And that was always my focus. You know, branding, marketing and business development as a trio is what I really found drove my business forwards. Incredible story. Starting so young as well, that's amazing. Um, and you know, looking at marketing in particular, um, and from my end, obviously film and video, it's not uncommon for people to get briefs through where they just go, you know, oh, I want a website or I want a video, um, but there's no real context behind that. Why do you feel that it's so important to do that initial research, the insight, and gain as much knowledge as possible? Yeah, so, so I think for me, the, the foundation to build on is the brand, you know, because I think that companies have got two choices. You're either building a business or a brand. A brand for me is all about longevity and sustainability, and it's moving from transactional purchasing into emotional purchasing. It's something that the biggest companies in the world have done for, you know, sort of almost centuries. They've understood that real inextricable link between emotion and purchasing and I think that is the basis of which you need to build on. Now if you're a company that's drop shipping from China and selling to customers on price you're not really building a brand but if it is longevity that you're after a brand has to be your goal. So in, in then taking that back to a base level you've got to strip away everything else, look at what the brand actually is, look at the objectives long term and start to understand how to build properly. You know the brand then is the subtle emotion connections everything from you know color psychology to tonality to voice but really as you well know I'm such a fan of film because I think it for the first time in human history companies now can create an emotional connection direct to a consumer you know we've, we've said before that back you know many years ago that was only reserved for the biggest companies in the world you know the biggest largest corporates could afford advertising budget to put adverts on television now it's open to you know almost any business. I think there's obviously a quality uh, standard there that needs to be achieved and an understanding of that whole process. Like you say, somebody comes with a brief, I want a website or I want a film. Well, it's really understanding, well, what, what are you trying to communicate through that? Most businesses make the mistake of jumping straight into a proposition. You know, when it comes to film or when it comes to a website, the first thing they're doing is talking about, you know, the how and the what. We've been doing it for 25 years. We've been doing this. We make thousands of different widgets. But actually, you've got to understand is, would you want to watch that, firstly? And secondly, what are you actually communicating to a customer? Because you know, there was a period where the sort of social media golden age, where if anyone produced a video, you were doing better than the competition. Well, now everyone's doing it. Everyone's got a website. Everyone's got social media. So it's even more pertinent now to really strip everything back to that branding process and start to say, what are we actually trying to build? What's the, you know, in marketing, you call it the hook. What is that hook that I'm trying to create that means somebody's going to watch my video and ultimately purchase my product. There has to be a reason, there has to be a deep why. I mean, there's my favorite quote to sort of finish on is Simon Sinek, um, you know, people buy why you do it, not what you do. I think I sort of couldn't have said it better myself. 
And I think it's really interesting, the fact that a lot of people are obviously doing video. It's quite a big part of everybody's marketing strategy now. For people who are looking at it and going, I really want that, do you think that though sometimes they kind of feel the pressure of, oh, I've got to do it because everybody's doing it, you know, and it's the done thing and I need to do it. I just need a video. And they kind of forget sometimes what it is that they actually are trying to aim for yeah. with their business as a whole. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think there certainly is that. And you, you get that with social media now. Sort of everyone just thinks, oh, well, I've got to be on social, whether whether I'm producing good quality content or not. I've just, I've got to post on Twitter 50 times a day and it doesn't really matter what I'm doing as long as I'm, you know, uh, I'll take a picture of my breakfast and well, now I'm out for a walk, so I'll take a picture of the dog. And I, I think there's a certain amount of that that's good. But actually, again, like you said, you need to come back to when you're trying to do it for a business. You need to really understand what, what your goals are and if you're just putting out content without that thought process, you actually, you know, a lot of SMEs that work with have spent a lot of money on video, but not actually had the results that they wanted out of it. And, and that is really because of that conversion. Anyone can pick up a, a camera or a phone, stick it in front of your face and just start talking at it. Um, but it's really about understanding what is that process and bringing a film together. And, and I think there is, a, uh, there, a standard has been raised, I think, within the world of film as well, is that because we're so much on social media now and because the, the sort of the age of the influencer and the vloggers and the YouTubers, when you look at their quality of content now, it's absolutely amazing. So I think that there is a little bit of pressure in that as well to cr create something that is the right quality mixed with the right messaging and emotional content. Because if you don't, chances are that a bit like a product on a supermarket shelf, if your packaging isn't good, somebody just, you know, uh, moves past it. It's, it's not even in their eyesight. And I think that's, that's the challenge, particularly with film, is how do you engage people? And it has to be a mixture of real thought process and emotional content to hook people in within the first five to 10 seconds. But then it's a qualitative aspect is actually, is this film pleasing to the eyes? Is there an element of sort of eye candy or entertainment or something that past the first 20 seconds is actually gonna keep me there? And looking at that, um, that initial insight and all of that research, how do, you, how do you actually go about that then? So obviously we know that it's important What's the first stages for you and the sort of process that you put in place to, to ga gather that information? Yeah, so, so I think stripping it back to basics and coming at it from a fresh slate. So usually that, that you know, is a, a workshop a day or a couple of days where working with a brand to really strip away everything that they think a business is. So there's, you know, there's certain processes that I might use to, to do that. And I think the best way is getting the team of, of stakeholders together, the business owners and staff members, if possible, all in a room, because what you also tend to find in a business is lots of people in the business think the business is something other than everyone else. You know, there, there isn't that consistency of, of messaging. And so I think that's the first thing is strip it back to basics, get everyone in a room, start to talk about, okay, let's, let's build from our foundations. What is it that we're trying to do? And I think, the one question that I always say to businesses, what is your mission? It's as simple as that. What are you actually trying to do? Because, you know, saying that your mission is, well, we sell products at a slightly cheaper price and slightly better than a competitor is not an emotional reason for somebody to buy in. There has to be a deep connection with your business. There has to be a mission. And if you imagine it, it's almost like wanting to go on an expedition. If I said to you, right, you know, Jake, I want to uh, go and climb a mountain. Well, where, how, when? I don't know, really. Somewhere, I suppose. I, well, maybe a hill. We'll see. And, and that's, I think, at the position that most businesses are at. Whereas if I said, right, we're going to go to Everest. This is what we're going to do. We're raising money for X cause or by doing this, we want to raise awareness of something. There's a mission that I can join in. So I think that's the first stage for a business is to decide, well, what is that mission? Because if you want me as a customer or consumer to buy into your mission, there has to be a reason. There has to be a reason for me to want to join in and buy your product. And that's when you start to get that emotional connection. So you start layering from basic and then building because then it's saying, well, is your logo, is your color scheme, is the tone of voice, does it match then that mission that you've started to describe and shape? 
you know, colour psychology is a, a massive thing. A lot of businesses pick a colour because you know their wife likes it or they painted the bedroom like it you know, a few years back and they like the colour. But actually understanding that deep consumer psychology is then that first matching stage of deep emotional connection to, OK, well, what does the outer world see? I say in, in an analogy that it's a bit like going on a date with a girl or a guy. The personality is the brand and the clothing is the marketing. Now, you have to make sure that those two match up. And also, you know, a lot of companies have got multiple personality disorder. You know, you go to the toilet, you come back and they're a completely different person and wearing a different outfit. And, and there has to be that consistency. So start from basics, understand what that mission is, and then understand, well, what is the fabric of that? And how do I connect to people? And video is, is really, in my eyes, the best way to do that. And when you've got all of that information, you've done all that research, I'm sure there's many meetings involved when it comes to actually getting really down into the nitty gritty of a business and the foundations of it. When you've got all of that information, what are the next stages when it comes to you know, building that brand, that business, and sort of shaping the way that they move forwards. So, so I think there's two things there. I mean, you know, if it's more of a startup business, you tend to find that within the first couple of years, people are pretty flexible. Yeah, you know, they're quite happy to morph a logo or change a colour scheme or change a tone of voice. But I think after that, once that research has been done, sometimes then it's just about having a realistic plan in you know a longer term view of well, how is this process going to happen? Because it's a bit like if you were to change your entire style, your haircut, grow a beard, you know, do all of these different things, if you suddenly turned up the next day to your friends, they'd be a bit like, well, what's, what's happening here? And you know, in a company, especially when you're trying to foster a marketplace, that might, might be a bit disconcerting. Somebody might say, well, have they sold the business? Is it the same company? So I think sometimes there is a kind of morphing process. So then that's about you know, a, a plan and a timeline of saying, well, you know, if we're going to craft this new messaging, how are we going to do that subtly? If we're going to morph the logo, when's it going to happen? So it's more about then understanding where's the business at, where are the stakeholders at? And one of the most important things is getting buy-in. Sometimes that, as you say, can take many, many meetings for everyone to feel comfortable. And I think that is easier to do if it is over a period of time. One of the nicest ways I think that both social media and video open an opportunity to do that is documentation you know, actually documenting that process and them saying, well, this is, you know, this is where we want to get to. Here's the end goal of the expedition. Here's the mountain. We know we're not there yet. We've, we're at base camp, but actually let's document that process of change. And that's, I think, where the video can add to that whole process, where then you're bringing the customer into that process and, and involving them. And you, you might find that by doing that as well, you actually get more feedback and information because of course the, the customer is the most vital sort of form of data and so actually bringing them into that process you might get positive or negative feedback that again if you're not trying to change everything tomorrow gives you time to morph and take some of that information in so it is a process i think like i said if, if it's a startup or you know a company that's early it can be quicker if they're larger it, it takes a little bit more time um, and sometimes that data buy-in you know people as the stakeholders need to see well if we start doing that documenting process you know we're getting good feedback are we not oh well actually suddenly our sales have gone up so it, it then helps buy in the rest of the team to then take through that process talking a little bit then about those methods and the methods that you use to persuade people and to obviously get these businesses on board i know you mentioned that they're quite innovative in the way they are but also a little bit unconventional yeah. um could you discuss a little bit about what those methods are but also how do you convince people that this is the right thing to do yeah sure so i so i think there's an element that um every business is slightly different it, you know there, there is this kind of bespoke nature to that process every different stakeholder or company is in a slightly different position but i think for me um, showing people that that kind of creative flair and getting people involved in that process. I mean, obviously, I think for me, it's quite nice. Often I can look back at my business history and bring up examples of things that we used to do. I mean, you know, as a as a chocolate company, really, in the grand scheme of things, we were a drop of sand in the ocean. You know, we were a tiny, tiny business in comparison to some of the massive, uh, you know, corporate chocolate businesses that are out there in the world. I mean, some of them are doing, you know, millions and millions of tons a year. And so us as a business, we saw an opportunity as a small business to be agile and to be different. It's, you know, I kind of dress like a chocolate box. This, this is part of my messaging to say, actually, a brand is all about being memorable. And I think that although 
you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You do need to have different spokes. So it's, it's about that creative morphing process. And so one of the methodology, methodologies that I use to bring people into that process is the senses. Most companies have never thought about their business or brand in a sensory aspect. And however logical we all like to think we are, you know, if you ask most people why they buy a product or why they engage with a the company, they'll probably come up with some kind of logical reason but actually we're incredibly illogical and emotional creatures. You know, you only have to look at the very smallest data on psychology or the senses to really understand that. We're completely overtaken by sensory input. So workshops are really good to open that up and say, well, actually, let's start to look at that sensory approach. You know, what does your company smell like? What does it taste like? What does it feel like if I'm touching your brochures or your business card? What, what are you actually trying to tell me through that sensory experience? One of the best places to ever experience that five-star hotels. You now I say to all clients, go and book yourself into a five-star hotel if you can afford it. But you know, ideally, you want to go in and, and just start to pay attention. Smells, sounds, textures, all of these sensory inputs they're using to elevate a customer into a particular um, mind frame and therefore leveraging that brand. So I think that that's one of the ways you can really start to bring a brand to reality, saying, well, it's all of this stuff on brand guidelines and on bits of paper, but actually, what does it really mean? Well, it actually means a connection to a customer. So workshops on sort of sensory inputs are a really good way to do that. And it's really fun. I mean, I think most clients would love the chance at doing that, to step away from the business. That's an important thing as well is to stop working in the business and come away at least for a couple of days to work on it from a fresh perspective, work on the business and do some workshops and say, right, let's, let's look at the five senses. Let's go away. One of the processes that I use a lot is a sort of creating a story or a festival or an event and allowing the client to really get creative with that and then breaking that down and saying, well, actually, what does that mean for your company? How would we extrapolate that out and put it across to the to the customer. So in a simple way for us, when I had the chocolate business, I used to wear chocolate aftershave. We used to spray all of our brochures and business cards with chocolate scent freshly as well, so that when people came to the stand on an expo or a sales event, you could actually see them walking away, touching it and smelling their hands. So it, it's a very simple thing, but actually from an impact, a brand is just about being memorable. And that, that means you're memorable. You can see that because I think as humans anyway, whenever you listen to a song that you haven't heard for a while yeah, yeah. or you smell something, you go, oh, that reminds me of when I was a child or something like that. It automatically brings those memories back. Yeah. And I think that's what I really like about that approach is that a lot of people, they see a brand as, you know, we'll, we'll have a guideline, we'll have, this is the orange colour that we've got and it's yeah. never sat next to the red and all that lot. But it's yeah. actually then peeling that back again and sort of saying, well, why? Yeah. What yeah. are the thoughts behind that, as you say, and those Correct. different senses? I think that's really interesting. And, and I think ultimately as well, when you look at the biggest companies in the world, they've all been doing it for so long. You know, if you want to look at data and say, well, why should we do this? Why should we care? Go and look at almost any big corporate, any really successful big corporate. I mean, Apple, I'm, I'm an Apple uh, product fan. You go into the store, they pipe scent through their air conditioning systems. They spray their products at the end of the production line. They engineered their box to open slowly to add suspense to the experience. On the top of the cardboard box, there's a scent panel that when you open the box, it releases scent. That then combines to an experience where you've opened a box, you've had suspense, you've smelt something that's triggered a memory. And then when you go into the store and you smell it again, that elevated um, sort of brainwave is then met again. So you're already in a happier place when you go into the Apple store. I mean, that's it. You know, if, if you want to look at an example of why you should do it, well, look to the biggest companies on earth, the most successful brands on earth. They're all doing it. Doesn't mean you can't as an SME. You know, it, it, chocolate, uh, the chocolate scent that we used to buy cost us, I think, sort of 30, 40 quid a bottle. So it's not, you know, we're not talking about tens and tens of thousands of pounds to do something. And, and that's the bespoking element as well, finding ways that companies can do it in subtle ways. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's it. That's, there's your data point. Well, go and, you know, go and look at the biggest brands in the world. They're all doing it, so why aren't you? And even when you go to a supermarket, I think I've obviously read somewhere before about how they pump the smell of the bakery through the air conditioning system. Correct. so that, yeah. And the bakery's always at the back, so you're kind of drawn in and Correct. you buy more as yeah. you come out kind of thing, yeah. you know. So, you see it all the time and I guess that you're kind of unaware of it as well as a sort of day-to-day -day. 
um, which is why I find it so fascinating, yeah. you know, because it's all in our sort of subconscious Absolutely. and everything I mean, else. Th this is it. And like I said, you know, five star hotels, restaurants, retailers, particularly high end retailers, you know, going to Fortnum's, going to Selfridges, going to Harrods. There's such a depth of thought process of where every aisle, where every shelf is, you know, there's they understand their business in terms of square inches, not square feet. You know, they're, they're looking at every single aspect and saying, what is this tiny little place? What's its job? What are we trying to do? What customer journey are we trying to create? You know, shelf barkers, point of sale, all of these things. Yes, that's retail, but you, like you said, you can apply it to any business. I mean, one of my first consultancy positions was a really high-end Indian restaurant in Bank Plaza in London, and they spent 15 grand for a company to come in and create a sound system and a, and a soundtrack that changed purchasing habits. So when they put on certain soundtracks, people would drink more or buy more food. Now again, you know, companies are doing this and have been for, for sort of years. So yes, not everyone can afford 15 grand for somebody to come in and create a soundtrack for them, but you can take the inspiration from that and, and use it in your own business in, in smaller and more bespoke ways. Have you got any more examples of how obviously you've took these strategies and you've applied them to different clients and also what the outcomes are with that? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so I think lots of examples, you know, everything from the grandiose ones like, you know, high end restaurants that have got the budget to bring people in to do that to, you know, texturing menus to changing tables to looking at, um, you know, cutlery and plates, but all the way over to, you know, a, a very small food business that I've been working with at, at a local food show. They've, they do a plantain chip product and um, we bought a box of plantains and wrote information on, on actual plantains and handed them out. So that, you know, there's something that's very, very simple, very cheap to do. But again, for me, it's all about creating a memorable experience. You know, it, it, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's looking at the most simplistic way that you can do that. I mean, there's, there's hundreds of examples where I've had, you know, done speeches or work with clients. I had a, a, an Instagram message recently from somebody who saw me do a speech and said that they've started using scents on all of their brochures and, and sort of letterheads. And suddenly they're getting customers actually noticing it. So there's, that, yeah, there's hundreds and hundreds of examples, but it's just about being creative. And it could be as simple as, you know, sending out, um, working with an agency at the moment to put together a campaign. The whole purpose and feel of the agency is a kind of beer and pizza agency. So um, we're sourcing beer flavored sweets and, and those mini sort of gummy pizzas. Again, to send out with products, it, it, none of this stuff is rocket science. I think that's the thing that I'm always trying to get across to, to customers. You know, yeah, I could talk about those really big examples where people have spent loads of money, but for me, actually, the companies that have spent small amounts of money but been really creative with it have sometimes got even more impact back from it. You know, but it's just taking that time to think about things in a different way and saying, what can we do that's ever so slightly different? How are we going to be memorable? Whether it's in the clothes that we wear or the brands that we use or the colours, what and why are people going to remember us? And I think that's the thing is that the examples obviously of Harrods, Selfridges, whoever the big yeah, companies sure. are, yeah. people who are a small business might think, yeah, but they've got millions to spend on Correct. this. You know, yeah. They've probably got an entire team who's dedicated to coming up with a fragrance yeah. that people remember us sure. by. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that's the key is about how actually on a small scale and as a small business, having certain things that people will remember you by is really powerful. I yeah. know that you've discussed before when I've been discussing my brand and we've had a coffee about it, the whole point of an emblem yep. and coming up with an emblem and something that people can remember you by yeah, in sure. that instance yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I think that that goes back to geometric symbology. So if, if you look at humans and human psychology, we are drawn into symbols and symbology. You know, if, if you look back in history of antiquity, all of our ancient languages were symbolic in nature. If you look at Egyptian hieroglyphics, and if you look at cave paintings going back centuries, we are a symbolic culture. We now see that emojis are kind of taking that position where we're actually moving back. There's lots of memes online about us moving back to hieroglyphs. Well, I think that says a lot about human psychology and if you look at the biggest brands again in the world you think about all the car manufacturers they use symbols now if you take away the word you take away everything else you take away the color schemes 
let's say Audi as an example, you know, it doesn't matter where you saw it in what colour and what shape, you'd still know that it was their logo. You'd still have that connection. So I think that's one of the first things you write is to come up with a symbol that's recognisable. Um, it's, it's a process to go through and for everyone it's slightly different, but I think one of the best places to start is something that's memorable to you. Some, some reason because you know a brand is also a story so if you've got an emblem mm -hmm. instead of just saying oh yeah we chose it because you know we found it on some stock photo site actually having something that is an emblem that's maybe slightly unusual but then creates a story it's a story to tell that says well actually the reason we've got this emblem is because my great grandfather had this thing and it was a pocket watch and it inspired me and you know we've got a pocket watch and a camera you know whatever that process is but yeah geometric symbology is um, incredibly important and I think again that's something that most SMEs don't really look at it's something that they skip over but you know even just taking 10-20 minutes go and google every single big brand that you know a huge percentage of them use symbols I mean Apple logo it's it's not I wouldn't even really call it a logo there's no wording to it but it doesn't matter where you see that Apple whether it's on a sticker or whether it's on a building you know what's inside. So that then communicates that power of moving past just a logo and wording. The other thing is we're a global trading uh, you know, society now. I mean, you can go on social media and have a customer in China within 10 minutes. So how does your logo look to a customer in China? It's universal yeah. language as well, isn't Correct. it? That's the key. And, and that's the thing with symbols, you know, an emoji. It doesn't matter whether you're sending emojis to somebody who speaks a different language to you, they still understand what it is. So um, I think that's an important thing to look at yeah. as well in, in terms of you, your company and your identity is we are in a global marketplace now and if you want to reach a global audience, how is your, your logo or symbol transferable? Bringing it back to film and video predominantly, um, one of the things that I always find when I'm trying to push film and video out to people is that it's because it's a service, it's not necessarily anything tangible. So trying to get people to understand where the value is and where the difference between a £2,000 film and a £20,000 film, you know, what, what you're actually paying for and what that extra is. And for me, it's always been within the insight. Um, so if I know, for example, that a client wants to sell, um, sell 300 lawn mowers, I know who that audience is that's going to be buying them, what platforms they're going to be on. Therefore, I can then, you know, obviously feed them with relevant information. I'm presuming that that's something as well that you get with other different types of marketing, whether it's film, video, billboard, whatever. What's your experience with that? And obviously, do you agree that that's kind of what adds the value to, to being able to sort of sell it into people? Yeah, sure. So, so I think the insight and the data is absolutely critical because, you know, I think the perhaps the issue that's happened within marketing over the last, let's say, 10, 20 years is that a lot of power has been put back in the hands of sort of everyone in the sense that, you know, copywriting is, is one of the, the natural ones that people gravitate towards because everyone's got a laptop, everyone can write technically, so everyone thinks that they're a copywriter, much like now with film. Everyone technically can video on their camera phones or most people have got a digital camera at home, so therefore they think that they can film, but actually it's, as you say, it's that quality and for me, what film does is it allows a window into a business but you've really got to think about what you want to put on show. You know, it's, it's a bit like having an open, re uh, an open restaurant you know, where you can actually see into the kitchen. Now, if you've got a grubby kitchen, dirty windows, the work surfaces haven't been recently painted, how's that going to make you feel about eating at that restaurant? And I think film is in, in a similar way, is what are you actually trying to show? You want to show the right things that actually are pertinent to the customer base. You want to make sure that you are creating something that is specific to an audience. I think one of the big mistakes you see, particularly on social media, people film one video and they put it ac across every platform. Well, every single social media has a distinct audience, a distinct style. So I think that's where the quality comes in. Yes, it's a service and yes, you've got a camera phone, but stick to your strengths. You know, like every business owner, you might be the absolute expert in engineering because you've got an engineering business or, or, a, or a chocolatier like I was, but actually, do you understand marketing and branding? Are you running a branding agency or, or a video agency? And if you're not, chances are that you've got to understand that everyone has dedicated their sort of life and professional career and education in something. Well, 
I think that's a little bit of understanding and kind of emotional intelligence to look at the other person and say, I'm looking at somebody who has spent, you know, an equal time to me, dedicated just to understanding video. That's what I'm paying for. I'm paying for knowledge and I'm paying for a service that is actually going to get me what I want rather than just sticking a camera at my face and hoping that something happens from it. I think the thing that I like so much about film and video is how it gives people personality because a lot of people, they can get, you know, a glossy website produced, they can have everything written beautifully, but there's no people behind it. And in my experience through life, really, people deal with people. Absolutely. And I think that's what video does and yep. it kind of gives them a face. There's people that you instantly then recognise that are associated with that business. Yeah. But it also gives you a little bit of a behind the scenes look at how the actual process evolves. You know, as you say, if it's all glossy on the outside, but then you go into the kitchen and it's disgusting, you know, it's just the wrong impression. So yeah. I think that that's what video does. And it kind of means that it's another layer that people can't hide behind, if yes. that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's the real strength in it. And f from your end, you know, why... I suppose as a whole question, so we've got it in one really, is why do you think that companies should use film and video? Mm. You know, I'm sat in a meeting now, Louis, what, why do I need yeah, this, sure. you know, and yeah, yeah. what clever ways can I use it? Yeah, sure. So, so you're absolutely right. People buy from people. And so if I'm on a website that has no people on it, um, I mean, just looking at stats, faces draw attention. So you go onto most websites, there isn't even a face, let alone video. So straight away, you've lost my attention. Where's my emotional connection to a faceless website with a load of words on it? Are you being fake? Are you real? Are you some con artist? I, I don't know because I don't know you. There's no relationship or rapport. So you're absolutely right that video allows somebody to step into your business and see you through the window, you know, get to meet you. It's, it's the only way that you can be in many places all at once. And there's no other way you can do that. It doesn't matter how many networking events you go to. Um, you'd have to spend your entire life at networking events every single day and meeting people where actually video allows you to do that without being there in person. You can send videos to clients. You can have something on your website that, like you says, immediately fosters that emotional connection. I'm getting to know you. I'm getting to know the business. I'm building a relationship and rapport. And, and ultimately as well, all good brands are divisive. They divide audiences. So another thing that video can do is actually... Um, funnel down your ideal customer as well because if somebody comes on they're watching the video they're getting a sense of who you are your business your values why you're doing what you're doing your mission they're either going to buy into it at a deeper level or be completely switched off but actually you want that because we all want people to work with us who are the right people we want the right customers we want our leads coming in to be the right leads we don't want our sales team talking to you know 300 people a day of which two percent are actually buyers whereas you know the video and that emotional connection is going to help remove that process and start to you know um, help that funnel process and people coming through into the business so I think there's, there's a thousand reasons, but you know, people buy people. It's about that emotional connection. And video really, apart from meeting somebody one-to-one, -one, is the only way that you're going to do that. You get a window and an insight into your business. You're able to show elements of your business. I mean, you know, we've all heard selling without selling. Well, that's another amazing thing that video does because I don't actually have to be doing a sales video for somebody to be buying into me because people buy from people. They're going, oh yeah, he seems like a really nice guy. Oh, I'll pick up the phone. And again, how are you going to communicate that with that video? What, a few words on, on a page? It's, it's, it's not going to do that. And I've always believed in that. For me, I think storytelling is really powerful. So when I'm producing film, first questions I want to know is that layer of the story, you know, and the purpose of that film is to tell that business's story. Now, that business sometimes are actually only mentioned in small little segments in almost product placement. So I've always believed in that selling people on the story and not necessarily the product. Um, I think that people are a lot wiser now. You know, it's not buy this, you know, you need to buy this and rep repetitive messaging. People yes, yeah, yeah. just switch off from sure. that now. It has definitely changed. Yeah. Um, and in next week's episode, we're talking about the next part of the production process, which is creative. Why do you think that from a creative's point of view, having this initial information is really important and why it's important for them to obviously consider that when sort of moving the production process on. Sure, so I mean, I, th I think one of the things that always happens in the process if you don't have that early stage of the, the data and the understanding and the process and the brand building on the foundations, 
when then it comes to creative and you know seeing this thousands of times with clients if they don't do that process what generally happens is the creative comes in they show them a load of concepts uh, the client doesn't like half of them and then you have to go through this ping pong match of trying to figure out what the client wants and they don't really know and so they feed back and some of the other team member who also thinks they're in marketing so so you get this noisy um, process happening where actually it's it's wasted time for the client and it's also wasted time for the creative you know if they have a really clear defined brief of what it is that they're doing i mean even comes down to color color psychology is relatively simple in a way so if you're saying well this is the type of business this is the industry they're in this is the color scheme because if we want to communicate to a certain customer this is what we've this is what we've got to use. If it's a symbol, we've already gone through that process to look at that. Again, it allows the creative to just work in, in a more succinct way. And also there's the, that better relationship with the client. They're seeing everything come together and that process can be managed a little bit more, I said, without this ping pong match of desperately trying to figure out, you know, whether they like it or not and producing 50 different brands for them to eventually choose one at some point in the future. It, it's, you know, for the client, it's all about getting them the results that they want and using all of that time inefficiently is, is bad for everyone in the process. Louis, I think that's all we've got time for today. Thank you very uh, much for no coming No worries down. at all, thank you. Really enjoyed that. It's really good to get that insight, I think, and obviously understand that bit of the process further. If people do want to talk to you a little bit about this in more detail, tell us where we can find you. Right, so um, Louis Barnett on all social media. Um, that's the best place to go, or louisbarnett.org website. Um, but yeah, uh, drop me a message on social, best place to get in contact and be happy to, to speak to whoever wants to talk about branding. And if we want to buy one of those shirts, because I want to buy one of those um, shirts, by the way. Halls and Curtis, I think this is from. Yeah, there's the, yeah I mean, I'm, I'm actually um, secretly planning at the moment it's not so secret but um, my own fashion range oh, exciting. Um, there you so go. yeah Exclusive so there we go but um, <laughs> yeah ho hopefully soon you'll be able to buy lots of very loud shirts from me as well <laughs> at the Barrett Film Company embracing insight alongside industry professionals like Louis is exactly what we do sometimes you may know that you want to use video in your marketing strategy but maybe not how it fits with you which is why we offer a bespoke service for every client and get into the nitty-gritty as explained today Thank you very much for watching. Next time we'll be speaking to creative professional Steve Price about taking our productions to the next level and picking his brains about why creative is king. I'm Jake Barrett. Please stay in touch via the social channels shown on screen now. And we'll see you next time for episode two of the Barrett Film Company Presents. Take care.